Hit it. It's Friday, April 8th, 2022, episode 175. I'm Patrick Ceresna. To help Kevin along with his uh, concussion recovery, we're going to give him another week off for some much-needed rest. But don't worry, not only will he be back, but this week we got Harris Kupperman here for his monthly Cuppies Corner, and he'll stick around to talk some charts with me in the second half of the show. So stick around. We've got a great show. Lena, I've got no beer to drink this week, so oh, we're not no. featuring a beer. But uh, why don't you give everyone a quick uh, update on the merch store? So if you haven't visited our merch store just yet, just so you know, um, and any proceeds that are up to April 11th will be donated to um, Koifin Charts Ukrainian-based employees. So please have a look. Uh, it's at markethuddlemerch.com, and please show us some love. You can get all your Lord of Crayons merch right there. Nice, nice. All right, and, and in uh, lieu of Kev, can you uh, give us some uh, um, a disclaimer and some side effects? Of course. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. Side effects of too much huddle may include squash court concussions, Ooh. smet wall woozies, mm-hmm. dome denting doozies. <laughs> Those are kind of mean, but all right. <laughs> okay, we'll get to your interview with Cuppy. So joining us now uh, for his monthly segment is uh, for Cuppy's Corner is uh, none other than Harris uh, Kupperman. Hey, how you doing? How you doing, bud? I'm uh, happy to be here. It's exciting. Oh, What's that's happening? great. Listen, I, I have so many things I want to talk to you about, uh, but we have to start with the, the big one. Like uh, uh, here we are like thinking like, what can Elon do? That, uh, that uh, could take it over the top from everything he's done. And then he t- comes out there with the announcement of, uh, of his purchase into uh, Twitter and getting on the board. I was like, I got to hear Cuppy's take on this. Uh, what's, your, what, what, what's your take on this? It's like two plot lines have suddenly converged in my life. <laughs> um, as Elon himself said, he now controls the memes of production. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really know. What's, <laughs> yeah, I don't really know what his plan is here. Um, you know, I, I I really don't. Uh, but I don't see how anyone can screw up Twitter worse. So it probably just gets incrementally better. And of course, in true Elon fashion, he filed his 13G like 10, 15 days late and cheated the market out of 100 million dollars. And I'm sure the SEC is just going to sort of shrug. You know, if I did that, you know, I'd be banned from the industry. But he's allowed to, you know trade and own more than five percent without notifying the market so eh, whatever <laughs> Two uh, that's, but, but it's it, when you're the, when you um, reach the state of being the richest man in the world right if, if it's like if you can't beat twitter you just buy twitter right the next thing you know he's gonna uh, buy out the sec uh, right? and, <laughs> just lbo it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Anyway, uh, but uh, what do you what do you think he's going to do there? Do you do you think it changes anything, or is this just a publicity stunt? I think it's just a publicity stunt. I mean, for Elon, one, it makes sure that he never gets banned from Twitter, which I don't know if that was a risk or not. But um, no, I think this uh, gives him a soapbox. It's it's one of the most valuable uh, resources in the world in terms of media assets. Um, and it kind of one-ups him and Bezos. You know, they've always been in their fight. Bezos bought, uh, what, what did he buy? The, 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 the one in D.C. Um, and uh, so uh, Musk just got uh, Twitter. It's, it's a much better uh, than WAPO. Yeah, it's a much better asset than WAPO. It almost makes you wonder if Bezos now doesn't come in over the top and buy 15% or something. Because, <laughs> I mean, they, a- they did the rocket launch things, and they kind of, did their rocket war for a while and they kind of got bored at that, at that. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the next step is. I mean, look, if you uh, said copy, it's going to cost you 10 bucks a month and you get an edit feature. Like I'd pay for that. I think half the people on Twitter would, and the stock would be like 200. <laughs> the fact that, you know, they spend $2 billion a year on R and D and don't have an edit function. I mean, look, you know, I, I run a lowly blog and, you know, we spend, uh, you know, couple thousand dollars a year on updates and you know i want to move this around move that around and you know my web guy isn't the best guy in the world but he gets it done i think my web guy could fix twitter you know it probably costs like you know five thousand bucks 
<laughs> so, but okay. Now, Twitter's stock has a big jump. You know, like uh, for, I'm uh, rounding, but like from forty and it hit a hit a near fifty five on the way up. A big uh, percentage gain on that. Giving some of it back here. We're trading around forty six bucks on Twitter. But is this in any way a game changer for the stock and their business model, um, or is it just going to be more of the same? And eventually, this will peter out. I mean, it, it's it's hard to say because. You know, it, it, we don't really know what Elon has planned here. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you that I took some of the May uh, 45s and I wrote them. I got paid three and change. So I'll basically, you know, if it closes the gap, I'll, I'll buy, you know, right where it closes the gap, which usually is a pretty good strategy. Um, you know, and it, it's undervalued. But you could have said that same, you know, many times in the past decade. and It's not made you any money. But, you know, you write the puts and they pay you decent yield and I don't mind owning it. And um, no, I'm not really sure what's going to happen here, but I, I think it's probably incrementally positive. I mean, Elon owns the problem now. He has to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he, somehow he he's like a magician and is able to like take companies that uh, uh, have bad business models and losing money and somehow turn it into something that works. It's uh, Yeah. He turns everything into a stock promote. Remember Dogcoin? Yeah. Uh, and then he had Shibucoin and then he has Tesla. I mean, none of these things are actually real. He's just made them into epic stock promotes. And I assume he'll turn Twitter into an epic stock promote as well. Um so yeah, I mean, like I maybe, said, I don't maybe mind, it's a uh, buy on dip here. Anyway, well, it'll, it'll be it'll be interesting. To, well, maybe what we'll do is we'll pull up the chart and during our talking chart segment in here. Um, but uh, so let's move on. I, I had to ask you. I mean, every year you plan your travel schedule around uh, going to that uh, Berkshire meeting. Uh, a you're like you know, I mean, you obviously get some value out of what. And um, uh, what what are you uh, looking for from the Oracle this year? <laughs> Uh, I don't get much value out of the two old men. I mean, I'm, I'm impressed they can drink that much Coca-Cola and not wet themselves. I mean, I'm half their age and I get up every 15 minutes from the terminal. <laughs> but um, no, I go there to see my friends. I mean, look, I have friends all around the world in this industry and it's great. You know, we, we, we text at each other furiously all day long, but it's great to actually see them in person and debate stuff and get drunk. I mean, I usually get there. I'm getting there Wednesday. Because my friends usually get there Wednesday and Thursday, and it's kind of like a five day bender, you know. Like a lot of my friends, you know, you see them in the hotel lobby, and they're already taking swigs at six in the morning, and it, it just goes the whole uh, five day period. Um, and it's just a great way to see people, and then a bunch of my friends have private events, uh, which is also great because you get to drink for free. Uh, I, I'd like to tell you know huddle uh, listeners that we're having a, a private event that Friday. And uh, we're going to do a little uh, Ketum uh, happy hour, I guess. And uh, my good friend Josh Young will join us on stage. And uh, we might bring one other guest. And uh, you lob questions at us and we'll answer them and drink a bunch of beers together. And, you know, uh, as a value investor, uh, you, you should appreciate it because the beers are free. All you have to do is RSVP. So go oh to my, my God, blog, yeah. Adventures in Capitalism, and click the link if you want to show up. But it's going to be uh, Friday. I think it's 4 or 5 o'clock or something. But it should be a good, uh, fun event. And you know, in, in the tradition of uh, if you had a good year, you got to give something back, right? <laughs> there you go. You know, I'm I'm going to book my flight now. No, it was, it, that sounds awesome. All right, uh, w w let's uh, let's move on because uh, I wanted to talk to you about like uh, the way. Uh, obviously, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. Certain sectors working really well, other sectors doing poorly. One of them that uh, has been uh, truly weak has uh, has been the home builders. Now, uh, when you look at lumber, uh, obviously lumber has been pulling back from its highs over the last uh, month or two and but the home builders have uh, just been wrecked making lower lows selling down um, is this a big buy on dip or uh, is the is there a recession coming that's going to keep these uh, um, you know in in the gutter for for many more months so I'm not sure if there's a recession coming or not I, I I don't think it matters to home builders in, in the end you know you just go with the demographics so that's what drives everything uh, we used to produce over a million homes a year in this country, single family homes. Uh, starting in 2009, we did 600, 700,000 a year. The population keeps growing. There's uh, 5 million uh, homes to catch up on. We, we also have a bunch of people that are uh, leaving cities and going to suburbs, you know, people my age having kids, people leaving uh, high cost, uh, high tax states and moving to Texas, Florida, 
And that, that demographic move probably adds a few million more to the 5 million backlog of single family homes that you need because people got to live somewhere, right? And, um, you know, I, I, look, the Fed's raising rates, blah, blah, blah. Everyone knows they're raising rates. Uh, I don't think they're going to get very far on raising rates because <laughs> quite honestly, they're going to break stuff. But, um, you know, if you add uh, 200 basis points to a 30-year mortgage, I mean, it's already happened. It's already priced in, even though the front of the curve hasn't moved. And it adds a couple hundred bucks a year, I mean, a month to your mortgage, but you save more than that by moving to a low-tax state. And everyone's getting big raises right now. I just don't think it's going to matter. I, I really do think this is a case of Wall Street having epic PTSD. Um, you know, got, fortunes were lost in 2008 and nine. And everyone just is, you know, obsessed with this idea that rates go up, housing goes boom. And uh, I think 2008, the problem is that you had a lot of speculators uh, buying adjustable rate mortgages, and it wasn't really driven by demographics. There there was a gap in people my age uh, buying homes. If you look at it, it, you know, people my age are kind of an echo of the baby boomers. So there was just like a demographic trough in population and, uh, you know, uh, family formation that's now getting caught up. But you know, adjustable rate mortgages go boom. We learned that. Uh, now everyone's doing a 20 and 30 year fixed. And I just don't think it's going to matter as much. And, you know, I keep going back to the 1970s. You know, they jacked rates the entire decade. Uh, and, you know, single family home prices tripled. You know, it's not tied to rates only. I mean, that was driven by baby boomers like my parents buying homes. And so, um, I think people on Wall Street have fought the last battle. A lot of these home building stocks are down by half. They have two years of retained earnings. They have uh, bought back shares. I think they're. I mean, we know that uh, twenty twenty two numbers will be record numbers because we, we already have the backlog. I mean, if you're selling these now, you're, you're, you're betting on twenty three. Um, I, I just think that it's a great opportunity. I, I'm playing it not through the home builders because uh, you know if you get it wrong with home builders, you end up owning a bunch of call options on Farmer Joe's land and those. Call options are worthless, and you know, the balance sheet gets shredded. Uh, I'm playing this by owning uh, the, the guys supplying the home builders. I, I had a huge position in Cornerstone, and private equity took it away from me. Uh, we talked about this in the last show, and I got yeah. a five bagger, and I'm sad. But uh, I've swapped that money into Builders First Source in Louisiana Pacific. Um, you know, they're, they're selling all the components to the housing, and uh, you, you know, I'm a bit more tied to lumber pricing, which I don't want to be. But in the end, uh, you know, homes involve lumber. And if you keep building a million homes a year and you don't build any more lumber mills, like I think lumber prices stay sort of elevated. And these companies are both have massive buybacks. But look, the, I'm, I'm down uh, 15, 20 percent on each of them. So maybe I'm the sucker at the table. <laughs> well, yeah, but I mean, you also are playing it, I guess, uh, in some way or another through St. Joe's and things like that. That stock's been holding up half decent throughout this period. I mean, it's making it's obviously pulled back in the last few days, but it's been uh, more or less in a nice clean uptrend for for the throughout much of this right yeah i mean i think of st joe's very differently though i don't think of it as a home builder because they're not really building homes uh they're no, selling yeah. lots and they're building commercial property and with st joe's you know i, I originally saw, I had a huge gold position i swapped that out in uh, summer of 2020 for joe just i thought it was a better way to own gold and i still think it is a superior way to own gold it's like buying gold at you know 500 when it's trading at 1900 you know it's uh Plus, you get you know all the inflation benefits. Plus, it pays you a little bit of a divvy. Plus, you know the the the, the book value is probably keggering along at like fifteen twenty percent a year. It's just a superior way to play gold. And I, I don't know. I, I I prefer St. Joe, and I'm I'm genuinely surprised it's not like a two or three hundred dollars stock right now. But. <laughs> <laughs> that's what makes a market right buddy <laughs> exactly uh all right we got to talk some uranium uh i mean here uranium breaking out to a, a fresh high looks like there's a a brand new bull leg starting here what do you think is driving this <laughs> what's driving it <laughs> guys like me keep buying <laughs> <laughs> well, okay no. um look it, uranium is a commodity i do a lot of commodity investing because commodities are super easy it's supply and demand this is like rookie stuff and uh if you produce uh if you consume 30 40 million pounds more a year than you produce uh eventually the price has to go up to get people to produce more of the stuff um, and you know, everyone always looks at these sort of situations of like, why isn't it happening? Why isn't it happening? Well, it took like 
three years to drain some warehouses. But it's starting to happen. And what's, what's driving it really is this entity called Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. And it's going out there like madmen. They're buying a million or two million pounds uh, a week of this stuff. And they're front running the utilities. And eventually, they're going to have all the uranium. And the utility boys are starting to wake up and go, oh, shit, we got a problem. Because, <laughs> you know, a power plant without uranium isn't very useful. And um, I think the utilities are starting to realize it's an issue and they're going to go out there and also compete. But what really uh, changed the, the whole dynamic is, um, you know, the U.S. is looking to cut off Russia. Europe's looking to cut off Russia. Uh, you know, Putin is bad man, whatever. But, um, you know, Russia is where uranium comes from. And so if you cut off the Russian uranium, I mean, where does the U.S. and Europe get uranium from? And especially enriched uranium, where Russia has about half of global enrichment. And so I think there's just a lot of people having this, like, aw shit moment. And uh, that's happening while Sprott's out there buying all the pounds. Uh, remember, there's a huge short interest outstanding in this. And when I think of it as a short interest, I'm saying, you know, if you do the math and you say, you know, X number of pounds will be produced between now and uh, 2030, X number of pounds will be consumed from now to 2030, because, you know, once you build a reactor, it mostly stays going, uh, you know, for 50 years. We kind of know how much it's going to get consumed as, you know, certain reactors like the Japanese, uh, you know, get turned back on or maybe the Korean ones don't get mothballed or maybe the Germans finally come to their senses. Um, you know, you end up with a bit more on the demand side. So the demand is growing incrementally from, you know, the baseline. On the supply side, you know, Russian gets cut off. You know, you have, you have moving pieces. But this, you know... And depending on how you pencil this all out and which mines you think restart when, you're somewhere in the like three, four, five hundred million deficit to well past a billion pounds of uh, total deficit. And that is a deficit that these utilities are functionally short. Plus, you have financial players that are doing funny things with carry trades. They're functionally short. Plus, you have you know producers that are short. And now, suddenly, you have what are called enrichers. And they're functionally short because many of them sold forward production. And uh, they're not going to be producing because underfeeding is becoming overfeeding. And that, you know, and it's hard to get real precise numbers, but that could be a 20, maybe even a 30 million swing, maybe even more in total uh, supply to the market. Because uh, if a separative work unit, the price keeps increasing. If, if the price goes too high, they're going to uh, massively overfeed, and it's going to take uh, many millions of pounds off the market. So you know you, you have the situation where this uh, functional short interest in the market. Because remember, uh, uranium is one or two percent of total power cost, and so you know as this uh, functional. Uh, uh, you know, the utilities can pay almost any price. They don't really care. But as this functional short interest of pounds of uh, demand for supply keeps e expanding, I mean, the, the, the industry is functionally short. Meanwhile, Sprott's out there, you know, a million or two every week. Eventually, this is going to break. And uh, uh, we're in the, 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 the part, uh, if you go back to GameStop, and I think that's, you know, a really good example, or you go back to like what Grayscale did to Bitcoin, you know, you're in the part of the cycle where it's going up, you know, one, two, three percent a day. Then you start doing like three, five percent a day. And then suddenly someone panics. And instead of sitting on the bid hoping to get filled, they just lift the whole order book. And I think we're a couple of weeks away from that in uranium. And we start doing, you know, fives a day or maybe even ten dollars a day as people just lift the whole book. Cause, you know, if you have a ten billion dollar nuclear power plant, and you run out of uranium, well, it's kind of worthless to you. And it doesn't really matter what price you pay, because in the end, you know, even thousand dollar uranium is a couple cents a kilowatt to the end consumer. And so I, I really do think we're about to be in the the, the, the fun part, <laughs> I guess. So so I got to ask you. So Jared Dillian came out with that tweet and it says uranium is uh, is working, but here's the problem with uranium: too many assholes in the trade. There are uranium newsletters, uranium Twitter, uranium bugs, and a whole ecosystem uh, uh, that has grown up around a micro sector that has a few bees on the market cap. Uh, usually, these trades don't work. What do you think of his skepticism? Oh, well, I mean. For a trade to work, someone has to buy the thing, right? You know, uh, you could have said the same thing about Tesla five years ago. You know, you had this little cult following and look, look where it went. I mean, at some point, someone has to buy the thing. It's not even that small of a sector. It's a small sector it, it just because the producers are undervalued. I mean, because a lot of the, the, the whole valuation of the sector is undervalued. In the end, it's, you know, 15% of global electricity. It's not that small. Um, and yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, like the, the whole bear thesis on uranium is that 
for a decade, the, this, this little niche of Twitter that's obsessed. But for most of the decade, there was a surplus, not a deficit. So they were just wrong. And now that it's inflecting, uh, you know, I think that the dynamics change. But yeah, you're going to have naysayers yeah. the whole way. And I mean, look, when I bought my St. Joe, what was it, like 20% of the float was short? Like, guys thought I was an idiot. You know, here we are. I've tripled my money like 18 right. months later. Like, sometimes, you know, you, you guys disagree with you. That's just life in this game. That's what makes a market, so, right? Yeah, well, that, obviously, uh, when there are when there is skepticism is still when, uh, you know, it can climb the wall of worry and there's still room to go. It's when everybody is so convinced that it's only going higher that uh, is the most uh, dangerous moment is there, right? And the fact is, is that most people have not gone all in on uranium. There's a small group of very hardcore people that are all in on uranium, but but uh, I don't think it's still a, a page one story, right? And and it's uh, not maybe, even a page uh, twenty story. I don't think anyone's yeah. paying attention at all. Uh, you know, you still have uh, the short, the functional short interest growing by a few million pounds every week. Like the utilities, the guys actually who are supposed to be experts at this stuff, they're totally blasé about it too. You know. And every time, you know, someone talks to a utility, they're just like, oh, yeah, there's plenty of uranium. Don't worry about it because, you know, the price of uranium has been between 25 and 40 for 10 years. They're just like, oh, yeah, once, you know, retail gets done pumping it, it's just going to fall back to 30. Why do we have to buy it now at 60? I, I think, you know, the, this attitude is really uh, pervasive. And that's usually when the craziest moves happen, you know. It's, it's what Twain said, uh, you know, Mark Twain, he said, uh, yeah. it's not what you know, uh, or what do you say? It's, it's, it's what you know for sure that ain't so or something. Yeah. Something along those lines, you know, and the utilities are just of the view that, you know, you, you call up uh, your, your local uh, carry trader or your local uh, enricher or whoever it is you need to call up. And it's like, give me some pounds and they fill you. It's, it's when they call up and, uh, you know, the, the, the enricher says, go fish. I mean, that's when the thing breaks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so let's uh, let's move on, uh, and I just uh, wanted you to sort of share uh, just your thoughts on how the oil market has been trading. Because obviously we had the first reaction, obviously on geopolitical events, that caused that big uh, jump towards you know one twenty five plus on the upside. Things have really calmed down. Strategic reserves are being re uh, um, released, and obviously a lot, some of the short term momentum has been taken the wind out of the sails. But uh, obviously the big picture story is still there which i'm not a uh, thing but how do you think this uh, plays out on the short term you think that this uh, could kind of grind for a little bit longer before uh, before it continues bulling what's your take on it well i think all good bull markets need to have nasty scary pullbacks that shake out all the tourists you know uh you know kevin so kevin's uh, out <laughs> yeah 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 <laughs> shake out the tourists time. kevin's out <laughs> all right time to go higher <laughs> But I remember that there was that uh, Sunday because I was with my parents and we were having dinner and oil opens at like 1.30, like three weeks ago, four weeks ago. And Kevin's like, you got to sell it, company. You got to sell it. And I go like, what am I going to sell? I own a DC 2025 paper. It's, you know, five bit at six and it trades like a two lot every day. And I'm like the whole open interest. Like, what am I going to sell? And he's like, you got to sell it. You know, sell the front of the curve. And, you know, I'm just like, I'm not doing anything. I'm, I'm enjoying dinner with my parents. And he was dead <laughs> right. I mean, it hasn't been basically an uptick since then. And we pulled back 40 bucks yeah. um and you know what's funny though is that the curve moved uh the back of the curve lifted my my, my calls went from five bit at six to six bit at seven so i'm glad i didn't do anything but the front of the curve you know where with yeah. all the liquidity is where everyone plays really active i mean that, that that got liquidated um i don't think anyone would have expected joe biden to dump the spr i mean that, that's there for actual emergencies, and his polling number isn't an emergency, in my view. <laughs> that's clearly what <laughs> you know. And so, um, you know, no one expected him to dump uh, the SPR. Uh, no one expected uh, Shanghai to lock down over Omicron. I mean, no one gets sick from Omicron. Uh, it's, it's not. It's not. It's like a bad cold. It's. It's not even a bad cold. Um, but but they, they they locked down one of the biggest cities in the world. So yeah. you know I think these two things played together. I think they've sort of fixed some of the bottlenecks uh, with with Russian exports. Uh, they're going to let Russia export, and you know there's going to be some you know friction along the way. But those Russian exports are still leaving the market, and so the combination you know it cooled off a market that was a little overheated. And, uh, you know, it, it's like all these great bull runs. You know, you have a you know a spike, you have a pullback, you have a consolidation, and then we do it again. And we're in the consolidation phase. And then, you know, Shanghai will reopen in a couple of weeks. And, uh, 
you know, Biden will run out of SPR to dump. And eventually he's going to have to refill that damn thing. And, you know, there'll be a bit under the market forever. And yeah. it, it, in the end, if you have a commodity where you consume a million or two million more barrels than you produce every day, the price has to go up. So, so someone produces more. I mean, last week we saw the Baker Hughes, uh, they, they had two net rigs. I mean, the oil boys don't care. Like, they're not doing anything about this because go out a year in the curve. It's in the 60s and 70s. And so if you're not making any money uh, and you, you can't hedge, I mean, I guess 70s, 75, 80. But if you can't hedge at a nice profit, you're not going to do it. You know, so the front of the curve, you know, the, 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 the 12-month timestamp blew the hell out and it came back. And every time the front uh, timestamp kind of blows out and, you know, you're the charge, you can, you can explain what that means. Uh, it usually leads to a pullback. And we, we just saw that. Uh, so uh, the, the, question, the, the question of my mind, and we, actually, you know what, let's save it for some uh, talking charts, but like the, uh, it's sort of like where, where's the next kind of buy on dip opportunity, but we, we, can, we can pull up a chart and, and talk about it then. Uh, anyway, you got to take uh, out your uh, expert crayons for that one. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll pull out some crayons <laughs> in a moment, uh, but let's, uh, let's wrap the, uh, the, the cuppy corner and then we'll, we'll talk some charts in a little bit, but uh, uh, why don't uh, you just uh, take an opportunity to uh, tell people where they can follow follow you and uh, where they can uh, follow your your uh, awesome work at Ketum. Hey, thanks uh, for the infomercial. <laughs> yeah. uh, go to KEDM.com. Uh, it's, uh, we're tracking about 25 event-driven strategies. Uh, it's really changed how I invest and trade. There's always opportunities. Uh, it, it's really amazing what we've done in bankruptcy emergence. You know, we, we flagged Diamond Offshore coming out. We, we, we just flagged uh, Embecta, which just spun off at a you know, single digit uh, multiple, uh, you know, it's diabetes uh, products. Um, you know, it just keeps flagging stuff I would have missed. And it just keeps creating alpha for me. And, you know, we're giving a four week free trial. So just go there, uh, give us your email. Uh, some of you have given us five emails now. <laughs> but, um, you know, go and take the trial. I don't think you'll be able to trade without it. I know I can't. And we built it uh, for hedgies because we wanted the data. Well, that's awesome. All right. And uh, they can also follow you at uh, H uh, on Twitter at H Cuppy, right? Yeah, go to H Cuppy. And if I'm not offending you, I'm probably not trying hard enough. <laughs> All right. <laughs> let's, let, let's go on. All right, so uh, so now, Cup. Normally, we drop you here, and and uh, Kevin comes in, and uh, we talk some charts. And while uh, Kevin is missing in action, uh, obviously tied his uh, shoelace is a little too tight and playing squash, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, and is now paying the price. So we're giving him another week off. So first of all, uh, uh, thanks uh, for uh, stepping up and uh, and talking some charts with me. And uh, and we, I guess uh, we uh, we have to wish uh, Kev a a speedier recovery right yeah i think it's like month two of his concussion now <laughs> <laughs> oh it's uh you know what uh we wish him the best but uh he'll uh he'll be back he's uh he's you know, he's getting his much needed rest in there but listen uh let's talk some charts uh, yeah. as always uh, Ke uh kevin and i start off talking about the top three things to watch so so just uh join me in in uh, shooting the shit about this stuff uh the uh, first thing i want to uh we talk about the things we were watching last week uh, we were kind of touching on what's uh next for the equity markets and we were in fact uh, looking at the chart, asking that, you know, after a 500 point run in the S&P was way overdue for a correction. It uh, really did get going. Uh, the question now is uh, this um, uh, a recent pullback on the S&P a buy on dip. And uh, so far, the pullback has played out and we'll pull up a chart on it in a moment. Number two, we were asking if the bond carnage is over and that's a definitive no uh, <laughs> as as uh, as yields uh, just keep going. And what's interesting this week uh, cup is that uh, it seems now that the longer end of the curve uh, on the, uh, is is actually gaining more momentum. The twos and fives have kind of stalled out, and uh, and it's the tens and thirties that kept moving. So we had inversion on the curves, and suddenly um, they're back positive uh, again. And and the thirty year yield is under pressure. Like how high do interest rates go? I mean, is this uh, is this far from over in your mind? Yeah, I think the rates keep going uh, in, the, in the long end. I, I kind of take Kevin's view that uh, they're going to go slow and pause and 
I, I don't know. Everyone uh, seems to be a, a hawk on Twitter. Uh, everyone wants the Fed to crush inflation. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, this is the same Federal Reserve that a few weeks ago was still printing money. <laughs> like, like yeah. what, what do you? I mean, how dumbest do you think they need to be? They, they, yeah. yeah. So they'll do ninety-five billion, maybe, maybe not. I don't know of QT. Uh, no, I think they're going to go really slow. They don't want to break things. I think the Federal Reserve knows that usually recessions are caused by them. And um, I think they're going to go super slow and let uh, inflation run hot. And I think that's a very divergent view. I think that was the view maybe six months ago yeah. that they'd go slow and let inflation run hot. And you know, suddenly even like Druck is saying, you guys got to tighten, you got to tighten, you got to catch inflation. Like Druck wants them to take uh, interest rates to seven points. Like the entire banking system will dissolve. Yeah. Oh, like, absolutely. Like uh, the, the, the 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 like eighty four trillion dollars of credit stock that's in the U S. system is going to be under a lot of interest rate uh, pressure under those circumstances, right? Anyway, but number one, uh, we were watching those FOMC meeting minutes, and well, the really um, they came out very hawkish. But uh, you know, it was uh, it was Brainerd that uh, came out earlier and kind of uh, set the market up for us. So it was actually a, um, the first reactions came. Uh, earlier in the week, and therefore that that um, that kind of real hawkish pickup that came on those minutes uh, seemed to have been already baked in the cake by the time Wednesday came around. But it doesn't seem like um, the, the Fed has any interest in uh, in taking the foot off the uh, the brake. Uh, in in trying to stall things out until uh, you know they like do they just keep going until they break something? And that seems to be the the way they run things, right? Yeah, I mean, in the end, they're going to keep going until they break something. That's just the way they do it. But I, I really do think they're going to go slow. We'll get a fifty because they got to show you that uh, you know they're, they're sort of tough. And then I think we're going to go slow. And um, no, I think they're going to get further and further behind inflation. Uh, and yeah, I, I think they're so far behind the curve they don't even realize how far they are. But yeah. I don't think they could do anything about it either. And if they take another, you know, ten percent out of the equity markets, I think that's all they got, and they'll uh, cower in fear and do nothing else, and let inflation rage. <laughs> all right. Well, let's talk about the top uh, three things that uh, uh, that uh, I'm watching into next week. I mean, you might be watching them as well. But one of the interesting things is we have the ECB and um, and like Bank of Canada, number like the global central banks. To, uh, uh, with their turn at the podium and um, obviously they've all been incredibly hawkish the question is do they just stay in line with a, with a, like a, a, a centralized global um, a view of, of the fact that they have to tighten globally and uh, and do they you know keep things uh, or do they have a, a, a divergent tone I mean obviously the FOMC is incredibly hawkish so I'm going to be watching that do you, do you have uh, any uh, take on what's going on over there? Not hawkish? Are you kidding? ECB is negative fifty bips. Like, where's the hawkish part? They can put out as many press statements as they want. Uh, didn't Aldi just say they're raising food prices thirty to fifty percent this week, and German inflation's running at like twenty percent? <laughs> These assholes are still uh, doing QE at negative fifty. Like, where's the hawkish part? <laughs> Well, I mean, it's relative to the past, I would imagine, but certainly they've, uh, I mean, that's reflecting, uh, we'll talk about that actually in number one here in a moment, so let's move on to that. But uh, um, inflation numbers coming out next week, and uh, the one thing that I'm sort of uh, in the back of my mind, obviously oil is a big uh, factor in all of this. The question is, uh, will we have seen you know, um, some sort of a short-term peak in inflation this month or next month? Uh, is, is, is that what uh, we're going to see? Is like, I, I certainly don't know how bold of a call I want to make on that, but that's certainly something I'm going to keep my eye on this week. Um, do, you, do you think that uh, in the Project Zimbabwe is going full throttle here, or are we, or are we going no, to see in some short-term short term we're, we're, we're in a pause. Look, Project Zimbabwe is a 10-year cycle, and uh, just go back to Zimbabwe, go back to Weimar. There were a few moments where they sobered up a bit, and they said, let's try to fix this because we know inflation's running away. And they took a little bit of pain. It was unpopular, and they started printing again. And I think we're in like a six-month-ish uh, pause. <laughs> but I also think it's, it's a big, big rotation out of – you know, asset inflation in SaaS stocks into asset inflation in uh, housing and rents and the price of tomatoes and, you know, real stuff. And uh, I like to joke that I have uh, a 2014 Jeep Wrangler. It's got 95,000 miles. 
And according to Kelly Blue Book, it's appreciating 20% a year. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of my best performing assets right now. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. No, I, I think we're just, we just moved, uh, you know, where the inflation is and we're going to cool off on inflation. It's going to, you know, rate of change is going to slow down and maybe even go negative for a bit. But uh, inflation is here to stay. I, I, I'll uh, agree with that in principle. Then uh, number one, since Kevin's not here to shit on me for it, I got to throw in that U.S. <laughs> dollar as uh, as the number one thing here. Uh, but uh, it, I, I I have a reason for it. All right, cup. Uh, okay. l- like when when I would pull up this chart here on the dollar, we'll use uh, we'll use this as our kind of way of getting the chart. So the dollar index this week broke out to a higher high, uh, and um, and we we're pretty much approaching the the hundred level uh, on the um, on the Dixie. And when we go to weekly charts, uh, I mean that breakout is seems to be targeting those 2020 highs near 2023, but like. Like we're it, it, with uh, with the highs even back in 2016 in that 2000, uh, 100 to 304 zone. Big question here: Is this a breakout in uh, in the dollar that's going to stick and get it back to like a a, a half decade high uh, on the upside? And uh, and that's a, what's interesting to me about it though, Cup, is that uh, the breakout happened on the Dixie on the uh, but the uh, the major components such as the euro, pound, and the yen have not broken in this uh, moment to uh, lower lows. So like, look at that Euro USD just coming okay. down to its previous lows. And so like the question in my mind, without the Euro actually breaking to a lower low, is that, uh, could the Dixie be a prairie dog? Could it be a false start on the upside? Like if, uh, if the Euro doesn't break down uh, right now, though, this chart is so ugly. Every rally has been failing in the Euro. And, um, and to me, like uh, if it can't hold this previous low, I don't see how we don't see 105 on the downside in this in this short term sequence on there. Uh, what do you think? Is is uh, the dollar have a little bit more left in your mind? Yeah, probably it has a little bit more to go. I mean, look, I think of the dollar versus euro is a big sign curve. I mean, the Dixie itself is mostly euro and yen, though yen is you know on the move. Um, yeah, here's the here's the yen chart uh, as it uh, it's. Uh, I mean, that was one move in March. That was a coin. Yeah, I mean, that looks like a shit coin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like a, th- a thousand pips in uh, in, in a month. Like, uh, it, it, unbelievable run. And it's now attempting to even break to a higher high. And like, look at the uh, pound sterling uh, creeping down to its, uh, its March low as well. We're, we're right at the cusp on all these three majors. Uh, and watching whether they break to lower lows or in the case of the U.S. dollar yen, a higher high um, it going into next week and confirming the Dixie breakout is in my number one thing to watch. Yeah. Is, is that not number one thing to watch? Yeah, I, I think dollar strength, you know, always caps uh, equity markets. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's bad. I mean. It, with with good reason. I mean, uh, the guys running our country are insane, but at least we're not Europe, and you know they're, they're stupider. Like, um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I still can't believe that uh, we're six months away from them stockpiling firewood for the winter. <laughs> All right, let's let's hit some different charts and talk talk some different things. So let's uh, let's start with this S and P five hundred. You know, like obviously after a huge correction through the start of the year, um, we got that uh, reflexive uh, snapback uh, rally, and it was a five hundred point rally in a couple of weeks. Just uh, an extraordinary reaction the other way, and we've been pulling back here now. Uh, my my kind of view is that uh, the the Fed is is going to be capping or suppressing uh, asset uh, uh, um, appreciation, and so as we approach the previous highs, the asymmetry of being long uh, the S and P five hundred is is probably uh, pretty shit. And um, uh, but the thing is, for me, I'm actually on the very short term not that bearish, and this is where I'm so struggling because to me, I. I actually think, uh, just looking at the chart, that the S&P can easily make it back to 
46, 4,700 uh, on the upside in the coming weeks. But to point, I, I kind of look at what's going on in that bond market and I ask the question, when do the equities start to give a shit that, uh, that, that the bonds are having their face ripped off? Same. Like, uh, like what's your thought on that? Well, I mean, in the S&P, I think of this as a failing rally. We're putting in a really nasty right shoulder. If you zoom out a little bit further on that, I'm going to go really out uh, you know, over my skis here and call this the right shoulder of a head and shoulders. It's a little sloppy. Ooh, I, 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 first of all, I'm not opposed to that view because, um, uh, because I, I – don't give a high um, high probability that the S&P makes a higher high. Uh, but while it could be a head and shoulders, but for sure, it could also be a double top uh, as a retest. Oh, you uh, 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 It's possible. Wendy's versus Chartist. <laughs> the, 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 point, the point being is that we generally agree that there's a marginal upside. So the bigger question is, is that when does the next leg of a downturn, when is the risk of the next leg of a downturn happen? I kind of look at it, though, cup from a, a pain trade perspective. If it just started to, um, to drop from right here, right now, it actually would be incredibly predictable. Uh, what I actually think the pain trade rate is, is it breaks uh, the high from uh, from March here, makes a higher high to sucker in everyone who's chasing a market on the upside. Uh, and uh, even under the right circumstances, it prairie dogs the previous high just to sucker everyone back in before the rug gets pulled out on a correction that could easily come down to like the Zuloft targets down like a 3,500 on the S&P. I think there's plenty of chance that there's going to be uh, downside, but is it really just that it sells from here? I I yeah, wouldn't I be surprised if the market here. grinds. I, yeah, I, I think, think it grinds grind and chop. I mean, we're getting into summer. And if I know anything about summer trading, it's that you lose a lot of money guessing direction. Um, it's, it, yeah. I, I think we're going to chop a bunch uh, in that range, you know, 4,300, 47. And uh, I think you're going to start seeing uh, interest rates starting to take a bite out of earnings come uh, Q2, Q3. And we probably roll the fall. Um, you know, there's that Fed put that's been there for 30 years, but now it's a Fed call. And I think yeah. people really aren't appreciating what that means. If, uh, you know, spoos go back to the highs, the Fed's doing 50s. If spoos do nothing, they're more like 25s. And if spoos drop, then uh, they're in a wait and see. But you have now have a Fed call sitting there at, at the highs. And I don't think it's a great time to be owning uh, risk assets here. You know, I, I've scaled back a ton. Um, yeah, I've been scaled back for like six months uh, outside of energy and uranium and my housing, which I just added because it's down by half. <laughs> I haven't done very much. Uh, yeah. I'm just kind of sitting and waiting. But yeah, it's, it's not a happy looking chart. And it, it, pull up the, the Russell if you uh, have. Yeah, yet. well, I, it's funny you just said that because this is the one that I wanted to hit right next. And this is the key. <laughs> really? is that, uh, yeah, yeah, because the, to me, uh, I was going to ask you the question, like, is this the real uh, kind of tell? Like, obviously, the S&P uh, reflexively rallied, which could have just been, you know, uh, uh, just you know, a van, a charm kind of uh, options driven thing as is it's, it's one of the most hedged uh, indexes out there. But, you know, you go to the Russell, which is really more reflective of the economy and, and what's happening in middle America. It, uh, um, it broke down from a major support line completely failed to in any meaningful way come back into its previous trade range and is rolling right over i mean it's literally a stone throw away from its uh, uh 52 week low yeah and it's a multi-year kind of uh, reversal trade um look if you look at the s p 500 even it's like uh, 450 stocks that broke down hard and there's 50 names still chugging along it might even be 25 names chugging along but it's basically fangnam and yeah. Tesla. And um, I think the, the overall stocks are starting to price in uh, a slowdown. They're starting to price in higher rates. I mean, with all the leverage in the system, uh, you know, <laughs> the Fed could talk all at once about catching up with inflation, but they're going to bankrupt everything in, in the process. I think what you see with the Russell where it, it, it rolled, it croaked, and it can't even seem to bounce, and it can't get it back above uh, you know, resistance up there. I think that's the real uh, U.S. economy. 
Yeah, it, I, th- I think you're right uh, on that front. And what, it, what I, I wanted to, uh, to also highlight is that, you know, a lot of those uh, Dow theory guys out there uh, love to look at those transports. And oh, just this week, this week, the transports ate it. And it's whether it doesn't matter whether it's like the UPSs, whether it's the rails, whether I mean, the airlines didn't go get hammered that bad. But the, you, you're literally like, look, look at the magnitude of that drop in five days. Well, it's a happened. big outside reversal day. Like yeah, it, it's huge. And it's like it blew through the its previous supports like a hot knife through butter. And the question is, is like, uh, you know, how how can you in any way ensue that the markets have a bullish underpinning when this kind of technical damage is occurring there? Right. And um, and, you know, actually, what, what we'll do is I want to talk commodities with you, but let's actually use this opportunity to kind of highlight some of these different sectors, because uh, like what, what I find interesting, uh, obviously, Let's use the, some of these uh, spider sector select things, but uh, the I would say the technology space looks very S and P ish and Nasdaq ish, right? Like there's well, nothing. To, it's, there's, it's, it's just Apple. It's, yeah, it's the same chart as Apple. So it's it's not even worth talking about. But what I wanted to highlight was like back to like Middle America stuff, like regional banks. Like uh, failed rally, failed rally, rollover, breaking supports. Like you, this. The, uh, obviously, rates are 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 the drag here. Uh, but uh, but the, this is just an awful chart. Yeah, it's nasty. It's uh, it, it's it's awful. Yeah, it's 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 nasty. I mean, pull up the home builders. It's nasty. Pull up. Yeah, well, no, that's that's that's, that's what I, that's where I, where I was gonna we we're gonna go. Like this is the ITB. Like look at the way the the home builders are just begin and been getting slammed to the downside. But the rotation, where has it been going? So like, uh, take it's all going to uranium. <laughs> well, that too, but but here's the consumer staples, like uh, a fresh 52-week high on consumer staples. Stocks like Walmart are running. You know, Procter and Gamble's going about. Johnson and Johnsons are running. Like, look at the look at the way the healthcare is going. A 52-week high on the healthcare, like ex- exactly at the Johnson Johnsons and all the other types of big healthcare names are driving uh, these moves higher. But how about utilities? Like, did you see what the uh, health the heck is going on here it's like it's wow. a bull market in utilities <laughs> when rates are going up like is that uh, people hiding and, in defensive names yeah what's what's happening i i honestly think that what's ha- uh, what's uh, what's happening is that to hide from the bond carnage is a huge asset rotation or sector rotation inside uh thing and just trying to uh reduce beta um, and uh, and go into more de- defensive high yield in this environment, but this is obviously not bullish. Like wh- you know, when uh, what when you're when you people are hiding in the defensive uh, sectors, it means that the underpinning uh, issues uh, haven't been resolved, uh, and uh, and it's just uh, it's crazy that we're seeing these this type of behavior on this. Right? The um, uh, I was what was the other one? Oh, but it's what's interesting is. Like, okay, so healthcare is making a fresh new high, but you take the biotechs and the biotechs have been in a bear market that looks like the home builders. Yeah, right? they've been the, crushed because I mean, speculative capital is coming out of the market and, you know, it's just crushed them without, without new inflows to speculative capital. It's just, yeah, it's obviously, hard. like stocks like Moderna were huge weightings in these things. And when they went from 500 down to, you know, the, uh, you know, wiping out 50 plus percent of their values, that kind of was a huge drag on this. But it's interesting that, you know, if your big, uh, large pharma with big dividends is, is ripping to new highs and, and the biotech. Are, are dragging their heels this way, right? It's, it's a surprising uh, number of small cap biotechs that trade at less than cash, um, which never really happens. You know, they always trade at a premium to cash and, you know, that, that cash keeps leaking. So the share price leaks. But, you know, if you buy it for less than cash, you have the optionality if the drug works. And you know, it's rare they trade for large discounts to cash. And there's a surprising number of them that are at, you know, decently large discounts to the cash value. I've never seen that before. I don't play biotech. And- but, but, but yeah, but that. when when do you th- think from a cyclicality perspective that that's I guess you need the speculative fever back, right? Like, I mean, they're, yeah. they're basically they're going to it's, it's going to be sensitive to the market cycle, right? I mean, it's, t- it's all tied to the same guys who bet on biotech drugs, bet on Ponzi's, bet on shit coins, bet on Kathy. Like they're all kind of tied together and speculative yeah. is out. Cash flows in. 
Now, I wanted to just uh, highlight this. Like, obviously, oil has been dragging. We had that conversation of what's going on on crude. Uh, but when you look at um, uh, the XLE and you look at what's happening um, in, uh, in energy, it's like breaking to a, almost a 52-week high. It looks and, beautiful. And, uh, and uh, you know, the equities are actually leading oil for the first time in a while. Exactly. And you know, for, for much of this cycle, you know, it was the price of oil leading equities and no one could touch these things. Uh, and now, you know, on down days, XLE is up. On up days, it's up more. It's, it's super bullish behavior. And, you know, just the way it's breaking out today with oil kind of, uh, you know, it's, it's near the bottom of the range of this like month long pullback makes me think that, you uh, you know, we're, we're near the end of this pullback because, you know, XO, XLE or XOP, like they're showing you where the underlying strength is. So so could it just be that uh, global asset managers have all finally accepted that uh, inflation and more importantly, stagflation are a reality? And they realize that there are existing, as, uh, you know, sector mixes in their uh, in their books uh, are simply not prepared for that kind of environment. And and the fact is is that moving uh, and allocating more into resources is something that typically is defensive during a stagflationary period. You think it's just uh, like big money could be just doing big rotation, and it doesn't matter what the underpinning commodities are doing. That this money is just uh, rebalancing in the in the equity portfolios. No, I think these guys really believe in their ESG stuff. I mean, they have whole marketing departments that keep pushing it. They're, they're just going to keep buying Ponzi's and frauds. I think this is more that uh, U.S. Uh, energy producers are not drilling any wells. They're doing buybacks and dividends, and they finally are impacting the share price by uh, buying in the free shares. I, think, I, I, I mean, obviously, there's a sector rotation underfoot as well. But no, I think the big asset managers, if anything, are still in divestment mode. I don't yeah. think they are going to change. They're, right, they're going to have. Right. It'll change only when they get redeemed. Right. All right. So uh, so let's. Uh, I wanted to touch on first of all these airlines, uh, and uh, they obviously were getting hammered during the oil price spike, right? And um, and they had a pretty solid recovery. Depending, you could go airline by airline. Some stronger than others. Um, uh, do you think that this uh, sector has the potential of, uh, of bottoming here or you, you still think that there's uh, uh, more downside on these? I really don't have a view, but I mean, I, I think strongly that oil is going much higher and that's usually pretty awful for airlines. Yeah. Yeah. And so it'll, it'll be interesting to see. The other one I wanted to touch on is cars, uh, which is the, uh, um, the vehicle uh, and, and technology ETF. But what's interesting about autos is like the main autos like Ford just keeps making lower lows. General Motors making lower lows. Like the, the main American wow. autos are just get, eating it. The only one that uh, is on cloud nine is uh, Elon with, <laughs> uh, with Tesla, like because clearly uh, economic slowdown and higher rates don't impact Tesla sales uh, and certainly shouldn't impact their valuations, right? Uh, but uh, but it's, it's interesting that most autos are under an incredibly large amount of pressure. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I guess that's probably the most cyclical part. But I mean, I look at those autos and I look at those charts on the home builders and I'm wondering whether there's going to be something like um, correlated in terms of when they finally turn. Or do you think it's, it's going to be more that uh, your, your bigger thesis on, on home builders is going to decouple and that while autos may be much more sensitive to the the bigger economic cycle and the fed cycle um that the home builders could decouple from that like uh, what's your thought well i think home builders have to decouple i mean you're long asset inflation with home builders and uh, we're gonna have a lot of asset inflation uh autos are tied to interest rates obviously so are home builders but I mean, right and now, credit, the and availability of credit, right? When these banks right. and, and stuff start getting under stress, they they they're not so willing to lend to uh, to the fringe lenders, and they tighten but, the, the. But the autos are really suffering supply chain. You know, they can't get components, they can't get chips. Like, it's it's a shitty business. You can't produce cars. They have a bunch of half built cars sitting in lots now, and they're missing a doodad. It's, I think, I think it's really uh, impacted them, and it's going to continue. I don't see. I mean, the supply chain stuff will heal a little, but there's a lot of uh, healing that's needed. 
Right, right. So I, let's let's pull up the crude oil chart. Let's talk commodities for just a little bit to wrap things up. Uh, so obviously, crude oil put put in its peak. It's been dragging its heels here. Uh, what do you uh, do? You suspect that uh, this is? Uh, I mean, could we get down temporarily under ninety on the short term during this yeah, pullback, sure. or is this already a buy on dip? Well, we're we're at this big trend line that kind of you know from uh, December, just like a straight up trend line, it's bounced off it a few times. We looks like we're bouncing off it again. So um, I have to use uh, a pretty thick uh, crayon here to to try to the, <laughs> the the line that you're you're imagining. But uh, yeah, so we're the, a little uh, below it. I don't know. Uh, um, but it, like uh, the the bottom line is is that um, there it's still making overall it's a, a primary uptrend right like you put this on a weekly chart and you zoom out well i mean like the only it, thing you could say is it's a failing rally it got back into the 110 115 area and failed and it could be a failing rally and maybe it needs yeah. to flush to 80 I, I don't really know i don't i don't have a super strong view cuz you know uh, front month crude it's it's based on you know who's locking down for covid this week you know i, yeah. I have no predictive ability but uh, longer term i think it's a great looking uh, long term trend yeah, I, uh, I I suspect that uh, as you approach ninety, that the asymmetry of going along around there uh, is is pretty good. It's uh, like sure, can it dip temporarily down to eighty five uh, below ninety? Uh, sure, but at that moment you're still talking about you know easily forty fifty dollars upside if it turns uh, for a, a diminished downside risk. It's a it's a good uh, good trade off on that way. Valeris V A L. Because you know, while you can get caught in the in the whipsaw of uh, oil, I think Valeris is showing you. You know, and this is how I'm playing oil. Yeah. Uh, you know, outside of those long dated calls, I, I don't know a lot of Valeris. I I think uh, people need to produce more oil, and a lot of that production is going to be offshore because yeah. they've already discovered a lot of this stuff onshore, and all the incremental discoveries are. Uh, offshore in deep water. And I mean, look at this chart. It's uh, more than doubled since we were talking about in the show last year. I think it's going to keep going. And where oil pulled back, I mean, this thing, you know, knock on wood, barely has down days. It just keeps consolidating and going. And uh, what? And you you think generally a, a lot of these offshore rigs plays are just uh, going to keep going, right? Now I, I wanted to to kind of pick your brain out because we had a a little a WhatsApp exchange on talking about it. Obviously, you like the um you know the the tide waters and things like that. Yeah, but well, I kind of that, that's a beautiful chart. Uh, uh, so so like it, it certainly is a beautiful chart, and it's had a great run on the upside. But uh, you started shitting on me on my uh, idea of rig uh and um and i i wanted to kind of uh, just throw it at you but like when when you have a um these like i i think back to uh when coal was left for dead and peabody was trading under a dollar a share with a horrible balance sheet and uh and essentially you know uh it, it, it was they were assigning like a 10 plus percent chance of bankruptcy on the piece of shit at the time and the thing rocketed higher even though it was uh, it, it was awful in terms because coal was low at the time but at, uh, i look at the stock like transocean yeah your argument is right that it does have a shit balance sheet but isn't that where you get the most leverage if in fact oil does go rocketing higher no is that no, I mean, look, I, I owned a ton of Peabody at a buck because um, it was a call option. What would happen? I mean, Transocean has a terrible balance sheet. It's got an ATM in place, so they're diluting you every step of the way. But it's it's, it's functionally insolvent. It has negative net worth, so if they could just sell shares at four and a half, they're actually adding value. Um, no, look. Uh, Look at these from a valuation standpoint on just an enterprise value per rig or per you know uh, ultra deep water, however you want to structure it. And you know there's there's a pretty wide bid ask between what uh, drill rigs are worth, and no two rigs have the same specs. But Valeris is by far the cheapest of any of the publicly traded rig players, even though it has net cash. Um, right. Transocean is by far the most expensive outside of maybe Bohr or one of the other you know big guys. Then you have like Diamond and uh, uh, any and a few of the other guys kind of in, in between in that range. But in the end, Valaris trades at a tiny fraction of, of the value per rig. You know, if you look at it like an enterprise value per rig. And remember, you know, uh, Transocean has more debt than uh, rig value. It's, it's, ins it's, it's, it's insolvent. It might be able to build equity over time and climb out. But I mean, that's a long 
hill to climb out of. And right. I, I want to own the, the rocket ship that's doing well. I don't, I don't want to climb a hill. <laughs> Fair I mean, look, look, yeah, I mean, my, my Valaris is almost tripled, and this thing's been stuck in the mud between three and four. All right. Let's, let's, uh, I, I wanted to uh, move from oil to uh, Nat Gas. And, oh, wow. Um, beautiful chart. And, oh, yeah. Actually, I'm going to uh, forget the uh, continuous chart. I want to actually – go out six uh, months. It's, it just uh, keeps making new highs. Well, even even just a, a, a May or a June contract, like it's just – this is almost getting outright parabolic uh, in the way Nat Gas is running. Uh, like um, it's 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 amazing that this one just hasn't quit, and this has nothing uh, to do, uh, at least in my mind, you know, with uh, with what's happening on the geopolitical front. Like uh, it, this is a more of a North American story, right? And but it it certainly has not wanted to quit. Right. I mean, well, I mean, on the fundamental side, uh, Europe. I mean, <laughs> that gas is too expensive. So all the industrial, the chemical, the fertilizer. I mean, more of that switching here. Plus, we're exporting it to them because you know they they turned off their energy, uh, or they I guess they, they they handed it over to Putin and uh, he turned it off for them. But um, no, there's this huge draw in U.S. net gas, and uh, yeah, it's, it's 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 stunning how it keeps going and. You know, I don't think we're going to catch up with European prices, but um, you know, it, it, it's a stunning chart, and a lot of the nat gas plays aren't pricing it in. And as nat gas goes higher, you're going to when people need energy, they're going to start burning fuel oil and you know liquids, and it's just going to basically pull oil up with it. I, I think is, ultimately, is, is every Sand Ridge still your baby for this? Uh, no, nah, I'm all out. I have no possession. Uh, no possession. Uh, <laughs> I made enough. like twelve times my money in a year. It was good. It's, that's I, I. You know what? I I I won't judge you for that. That seems reasonable. <laughs> All right. I, I guess I want to say this this uh, Henry Hub it looks like it's starting to go parabolic. I think every commodity does this, you know. The, the the ones that are bid, the ones that aren't bid, the popular ones, you know. I, I'm I'm really scared corn, wheat and soy do that. But I, I think before let's, this let's uh, talk about cycle them. is done, they're all let's, gonna do blow offs. Well, I mean, arguably, wheat did have uh, a pretty big, you know, on that. Ge- oh, that's a beautiful board. pennant back above uh, yeah. eleven fifty. I just think it doesn't stop. I, I think it, it, just it, it could just go and rip. But look at the way corn is working its way up to along its highs, uh, ready it's, to go yeah. for another breakout. And the beans had a pullback, recovering very quickly. Uh, yeah, the like, beans uh, stopped everyone out back into the range. No, these are strong trends. Exactly. Like uh, they, they're all, they all seem so positive. And, and you're just uh, to your point about just all of these commodities, like, uh, like, uh, you know, you take a look at zinc, um, you know, it just keeps just, going, just keeps going. Uh, the one that's been in the, the gutter has been copper though. Right. Um, and, uh, and I'm just curious when copper joins the party. They all will eventually. They're all going to go. They're all going to go. I mean, copper, it's doc copper. So it, it's telling you the, the economy is slowing a little globally, but they're, they're all going to go. Yeah, it's uh, it's re- it's really interesting there. Now, of course, uh, I know you don't take uh, any uh, uh, strong positions in in gold miners and things like this, but uh, you know what? Uh, you know, you were talking about that kind of wedging pennant type formation, but it, it's a uh, nice almost, chart. It, it's a nice chart. Like it, it, this could roll up. I mean, if we if you clear nineteen sixty nineteen seventy on the upside, uh, the next leg of gold may get underway here, right? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm positive towards gold. My worry about gold is that I feel a lot of the risk parity boys swapped out their uh, 30-year bonds for gold uh, just because they wanted to hedge against some inflation. And, you know, it, risk parity, like, look, if you, you had a 60-40 portfolio, you got crushed this year on the bond side and the equity side. Uh, and I feel like a lot of those guys are long uh, gold and uh, – you know, if you have some sort of liquidation moment, they're going to puke up the gold, just like we saw in uh, March of 2020. That's really kept me out of gold. I'd much rather own Joe than gold. I mean, for me, Joe is gold. There you go. Uh, I wanted to, instead of just talking about bonds, I wanted to actually highlight just the corporates, particularly uh, junk bonds, because uh, uh, for the longest time, uh, junk bonds have generally uh, had a pretty good correlation to equities. And um, and they have really been dragging, 
And, uh, and, you know, to me, this is almost like a little bit of a canary in the coal mine. Like while I, uh, you know, still on look at that S&P chart and ask whether there's one more leg higher. But when I look at the way, uh, you know, interest rates are rising and the way these junk bonds are getting hammered, it, it, it just um, it makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. It just makes uh, so many question marks as to what's next here. Well, right? the, Fed is, the Fed is draining liquidity and, you know, yields are going to, you know, rise and uh you know the spread between uh uh junk and you know corporates is going to widen and this is natural why don't you pull up a chart of ether and you all can send your hate mail to me as opposed to kevin this week yeah yeah no problem <laughs> but it, it looks like a nasty head and shoulders to me with a fit with, and it looks like uh, that rally has just failed Interesting. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's also the Fed just pulling liquidity out of the market. And, you know, I, I think cryptos are, are like, the, the, like, I mean, the chart of Bitcoin doesn't look much different, right? I no, mean, no, they all have different the percentage same. ranges, but they, they all kind of broke those February highs. They look like a breakout. They're all pulling back. I, I, I drew the fibs on this. I'm, I, I would need, let's say, a breakdown on uh, Ether, uh, Ethereum below 3000 to really start getting nervous about it. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's it, certainly, been dragging its heels along the way here and it's starting to look like a failed rally in a right shoulder and bitcoin kind of looks the same please don't send me hate mail i, I love crypto oh, they will. but it's, they it's, will. it's not the time to own it. It, it there'll be a time to own it but you buy crypto when the fed's adding liquidity or six months before they add liquidity you don't add it you don't do it when they've told you they're gonna take the liquidity out of the market here's my call i uh, i think both ethereum and bitcoin first make one more punch higher i wouldn't be shocked if this goes all the way back to that august high near four thousand, just to get everyone uh, chasing it back in, and then it rolls over. I think uh, I, uh, I, while well, I, in the bigger view, I, I sort of have the same tilt as you that uh, that it's which way it's going. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it first uh, faked everyone out one more time. Well, yeah, we'll I see. can chop around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the last thing I want to bring back uh, something from the past, like uh, years ago when we had you on the show early on, we talked Greece. <laughs> we, 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 you, you have not touched on Greece for years. And, uh, have you completely uh, lost interest in this story, or is there no, some hidden? All. Is there some hidden little position you still have in this thing? <laughs> okay, I'll fess up. I own some Piraeus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I bought it at a buck. Uh, I bought it at a euro fifteen or euro eighteen when the market kind of crapped its brains out like uh, when Putin invaded. Look, um, I think Greek banks are finally time. And I, I know uh, people have said that for 10 years and lost everything, but um, they really have cleaned up their balance sheets finally. There's actually a yield curve in Greece for the first time in uh, a decade. Um, Greece uh, has a rapidly growing economy. They got huge stimmy payments from uh, the ECB and the Eurozone. Tourism's picking up again, which is you know a huge piece of the economy there. Um, you know they, they just had a bad go of it with COVID, yeah. and uh, the the guys running it are doing a good job. And I think the Greek banks are quite cheap. I, I think you buy all four of them. I don't think you have to even be all that smart in choosing which one. There you go. Well, listen, Cuppy. That, well, well, that's where we'll leave it for a wrap. I wanted to thank you so much for uh, staying on longer to join me for a, a chat about charts. I really had a great time, and uh, thank you so much. And uh, we obviously both wish uh, Kevin a, a speedy recovery, but uh, you did a great job stepping in, and I think everyone appreciated it. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. I, I took my crayons out for the first time in a decade. It's it's <laughs> it, it's kind of hard. <laughs> it's hard, but uh, you know what? You seemed like you were picking it up like a natural very quickly. You know, uh, we might have to have you step up and uh, and talk some charts more often with me, bud. <laughs> anytime, anytime. <laughs> All right. Anyway, thanks a lot, Cup. Have a good one. Cheers, buddy. Thank you too. Cheers. Thanks for tuning into The Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending the time with us. Please give us a follow at The Market Huddle. You can also follow Kevin at Kevin Muir and follow Patrick at Patrick Ceresna. And please, if you could, rate and review us on iTunes. And listen, you can never have too many friends, bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend the time together on this crazy ride. See you next week.